he will like himself, for he will discover he's quite a person after all. He will recognize and accept the things he cannot do as well as some other people, but he'll also understand and appreciate those things it's been given him to do well. He will accept himself for what he really is, one of a kind, as different from every other person on earth as his fingerprints or his signature. Imagine that you're seated in a theater looking at the curtain which hides the blank screen as you wait for the feature picture to begin. What will this picture do for you? How will it affect you? What impact will it have on your life? Will you feel moved, perhaps even to tears? Will you laugh at a comedy or feel terrified at the crises faced by the hero or heroine? Will you feel wonderful waves of love and compassion or surges of resentment? All these feelings will pulse through you and more. For the picture you will see is about the most fascinating person in the world, yourself. In this theater, which is in the mind and heart of each of us, you are the producer, director, writer, actor or actress, hero, and the villain. You are the film technician up in the booth and the audience which reacts to this thrilling drama. The exciting story unfolding upon this inner screen is one which is invented every second of your life, yesterday, tomorrow, but most important, right now. You watch the image upon that screen, and you invent the image upon that screen right now. Will the story have a happy ending? Is it full of happiness and success, or sorrow and failure? The storyline is already there, and the discerning eye can tell the direction in which the story will go. But one realization can comfort you. Since you are the dramatist, the director, and the actor, you can change the story as it unfolds. Now, this instant, and for your whole lifetime. It seems that you can make this a success story. You can be the hero and conquer the villain. You can make this a heartwarming story which will enrich the lives of all who know you, rather than a drab mechanical tale, a chronicle of boredom. It's all inside you. It all depends on what you do with an image you carry inside you, an image which is your most important tool for good or for ill. It all depends on you and your self-image. The self-image is your own conception of the sort of person you are. It's a product of past experiences, successes and failures, humiliations and triumphs, and the way other people react to you, especially in early childhood. From these factors and from others, you build up a picture of yourself which you believe is true. The picture may be false, and in many cases is false, but the important fact here is that you act just as if it were true. For all intents and purposes, it is true. If it's a good, healthy, successful self-image, fine. But if it can stand some improvement, you can change it for the better and start getting the kind of results such a change will bring about. Our thoughts, habits, even our abilities must be those of the person we believe ourselves to be. We can set new limits in place of old ones. But we can't surpass the limits of our current self-image. There's a story about a Wisconsin farmer who was walking through his fields one day when he stumbled over a little glass jug in his pumpkin patch. Out of curiosity, he poked a young pumpkin through the neck of the jug, being careful not to break the vine. Then he placed his little experiment back on the ground and walked away. When harvest time came, the farmer was working his way down a row of big ripe pumpkins when he again came upon the glass jug. But this time it looked different. Picking it up, he discovered that the young pumpkin he'd poked inside now completely filled its glass prison. Having no more room, it had stopped growing. The farmer broke the jug and held in his hand a runt pumpkin, less than half the size of all the other pumpkins, and exactly the shape of the jug. Well, people aren't pumpkins, but our self-image is something like that jug. It determines the size and kind of person we become. The similarity ends with the fact that we can remove our self-imposed limitations by enlarging our self-image. We form a mental picture of ourselves through experience, and we can change that picture the same way, through experience. If the actual experience we need is not available to us, we can, according to self-image psychology, create that experience synthetically. Now, scientists agree that the human nervous system is incapable of distinguishing between actual experience and the same experience imagined vividly and in complete detail. Worry is a good example of this synthetic experience. When a person worries about something, he projects himself mentally, emotionally, even physically into a situation that hasn't even occurred. The man who worries intensely about, well, say, failure, 
finds himself experiencing the same reactions that accompany actual failure, feelings of anxiety, inadequacy, and humiliation, and eventually headaches and an upset stomach. As far as his mind and body are concerned, he has failed. And if he worries about it long enough, if he concentrates on failure intensely enough, he will upset himself to the extent that he will fail, and he'll get sick. Now, everything can be used in either of two ways, positively or negatively, constructively or destructively. Worry is the negative use of creative imagination. It's a negative synthetic experience. But most people apparently never realize that positive results, just as real as the negative results of worry, can be achieved through using our imagination constructively. The man who worries about failure is unwittingly defeating himself. He's feeding his mind the wrong data. If he spent the same amount of time visualizing success as he spends thinking about failure, he could reverse the process of synthetic experience. Instead of anxiety, he could develop confidence, self-assurance, poise, and a feeling of well-being would replace apprehension. By concentrating on the success he desires, by synthetically experiencing that success, he can expand his self-image into that of a person for whom success is normal, expected. Why not practice holding the self-image of the person you most want to become? This is the person you can become. Use your spare moments to concentrate on your goals and the greater success you seek. Analyze your past successes and formulate ways your success can be increased in the future. Put more into the positive use of your imagination than you ever put into its negative use, worry. You're merely reversing the same creative process. Now it's working for you instead of against you. Nobody pokes us into glass prisons beyond which we can't grow. But all too often, almost unknowingly, we set unnecessary limits for ourselves by holding a self-image that's restricted, inadequate for the full realization of our potentialities. Each of us is, at this moment, the product of all his thoughts and experiences and environment up to this point. Through thought, we can control to an almost unbelievable degree both our experience and our environment from here on. Whether or not we choose to direct our own course through life is entirely up to us. The important thing is to know that it can be done. One time the late Dr. Maxwell Maltz, whom we called Uncle Max, dropped by my office for a chat and lunch. We got to talking on his favorite subject, namely how a person can come to grips with himself, develop a healthy self-image, and find freedom in the world. He told me he had discovered four important steps a person can take on a regular basis to form the new habits that can build a healthy, new self-image. And as he talked at lunch, I made notes on a scrap of paper. Here are his four points in the order in which he gave them to me. Number one, forgive others with no strings attached. You must clean the slate absolutely. Forgive every person against whom you might hold some kind of grudge. Clean the slate you do this for your own sake, your own peace of mind. We don't hurt others when we hold hatred toward them. We hurt ourselves. Seriously, it can lead to serious illness. So number one, forgive others, all others. If you cannot take this first step, you can forget the rest. You haven't grown up yet. Two, forgive yourself. See yourself with kind eyes. Try to forget completely all the idiotic things you've done, the pain you've given to others, the embarrassments you've suffered, the mistakes you've made in the past. Forgive yourself. Wipe clean the slate. Look in the mirror, he said, and forgive yourself. Practice this, and you can actually pull it off. Now, it's not easy to forgive ourselves. We tend to be much tougher on ourselves than we are on others. But the fact is, blame doesn't help. It's a destructive emotion. See yourself with kind eyes. That's number two. Number three, see yourself at your best. As Dr. Maltz put it, we can start the day in frustration or confidence. Take your pick. Now, the intelligent thing to do is to pick confidence, if it's at all possible. There are bad days, but it's better to begin the day in a confident mood than in a mood of frustration. And number four, keep up with yourself. Don't worry about what others are doing or what others have done or have. 
Keep your pace. It's different from the pace of others. It's faster than some. It's slower than others. Forget the Joneses. And don't feel guilty about moving ahead of some of your contemporaries. The person who deliberately holds himself down to a slower pace just to be one of the gang is a fool. Keep up with yourself. Live the life you want to live. Earn what you want to earn in serving others and do what you want to do. Live your own life and don't be too concerned about how others are living theirs. Four steps to a healthy self-image. One, forgive others. Two, forgive yourself. Three, see yourself at your best. Choose confidence instead of frustration. And four, keep up with yourself. March to your own drummer and don't worry about what others are doing. You know, the words, know thyself, are still two of the most important words ever put together. You know why people sometimes, quite often as a matter of fact, have inferiority complexes? It's because their thinking is based on a false premise. The false premise is that they compare themselves to other people. Well, this is actually something they should never do, since no two human beings are alike. Everybody on Earth is inferior to everyone else on Earth in certain areas and superior in other areas. This is why the well-adjusted person, the person who knows himself, isn't bothered because he can't dance as well as so-and-so or play golf or bridge as well as someone else. It would be completely impossible for any one human being to be as good at everything as every other human being. In his fine book, Psycho-Cybernetics, Dr. Maxwell Maltz wrote, inferiority and superiority are reverse sides of the same coin. The cure lies in realizing that the coin itself is spurious. You are not inferior or are not superior. You are simply you. You as a personality are not in competition with any other personality simply because there's not another person on the face of the earth like you or in your particular class. You're an individual. You are unique. You are not like any other person. You're not supposed to be like any other person. And no other person is supposed to be like you. The doctor went on to write, God did not create a standard person and in some way label that person by saying, this is it. He made every human being individual and unique, just as he made every snowflake individual and unique. God created short people and tall people, Dr. Maxwell Maltz wrote, large people and small people, skinny people and fat people, black, yellow, red, and white people. He's never indicated any preference for anyone's size, shape, or color. Abraham Lincoln once said, God must have loved the common people, for he made so many of them. He was wrong. There is no common man, no standardized common pattern. He would have been near the truth had he said, God must have loved uncommon people, for he made so many of them. Anybody could make himself feel inferior if he didn't realize that he's unlike any other human being who ever lived on earth. If he understands fully and completely, intellectually and emotionally, that he is a unique and different individual, he cannot have an inferiority complex. How could he? Since there's no standard against which to judge if every person is different, and every person is different, man and woman. Nothing on earth happens purely by accident. A person is living because he was meant to live, and he has talents and abilities that are totally his own or her own, unique with him or her. His job then as a person is to learn to know himself. If he does, he will like himself, for he will discover he's quite a person after all. He will recognize and accept the things he cannot do as well as some other people. But he'll also understand and appreciate those things it's been given him to do well. He will accept himself for what he really is, one of a kind, as different from every other person on earth as his fingerprints or his signature. A human being is the finest, the noblest, the most godlike creature ever produced on earth. Not to be thankful for such a gift is the worst kind of ignorance, and an inferiority complex is a phantom, a ghost with no real substance. In the light of knowledge, it disappears. Of all the traps and pitfalls in life, self-disesteem is the deadliest and the hardest to overcome, for it is a pit designed and dug by our own hands, summed up in the phrase, it's no use, I can't do it.
The penalty of succumbing to it is heavy, both for the individual in terms of material rewards lost and for society in gains and progress unachieved. On those days when we're most subject to fearful unbelief in ourselves, when we most doubt ourselves and feel inadequate to our task, isn't it precisely then that we're most difficult to get along with? We simply must get it through our heads that holding a low opinion of ourselves is not a virtue, but a vice. Jealousy, for example, which is the scourge of many a marriage, is nearly always caused by self-doubt. The person with adequate self-esteem doesn't feel hostile toward others. He is not to prove anything. He can see the facts more clearly, isn't as demanding in his claims on other people. The housewife, who felt that a facelift might cause her husband and children to appreciate her more, really needed to appreciate herself more. Middle age, plus a few wrinkles and a few gray hairs, had caused her to lose self-esteem. She then became supersensitive to innocent remarks and actions of her family. And so here's Dr. Maxwell Maltz's prescription for restoring your self-esteem. Stop carrying around a mental picture of yourself as a defeated, worthless person. Stop dramatizing yourself as an object of pity and injustice. You know, the word esteem literally means to appreciate the worth of. Why do men stand in awe of the stars and the moon, the immensity of the sea, the beauty of a flower or a sunset, and at the same time downgrade themselves? Did not the same creator make man? Is not man himself the most marvelous creation of all? This appreciation of your own worth is not egotism unless you assume that you made yourself and should take the credit. Do not downgrade the product merely because you haven't used it correctly. Don't childishly blame the product for your own errors like the schoolboy who said, this typewriter can't spell. But the biggest secret of self-esteem is this. Begin to appreciate other people more. Show respect for any human being merely because he's a child of God and therefore a thing of value. Stop and think when you're dealing with people. You're dealing with a unique individual creation of the creator of all. Practice treating other people as if they had some value, and surprisingly enough, your own self-esteem will go up. For real self-esteem is not derived from the great things you've done, the things you own, or the mark you've made, but an appreciation of yourself for what you are. If you're lacking in self-esteem, it's because you don't understand who or what you really are. If you'll take the time to learn more about yourself, you'll be delighted at what you discover. The self-esteem that comes from knowing we can be in charge of our own lives, I think this is what gives us self-esteem. All of a sudden we realize that, as the old poem has it, uh, Invictus, uh, I am captain of my fate, I am master of my soul. I'm in charge here, and... Uh, this is wonderful. I think most people start out with a wonderful self-image. I think babies, uh, little children start out just, you know, so with it, so full of life and, and fun. And then they're ground down uh, quite often by their environment uh, and pushed into little uh, rigid cubby holes into which they're forced to uh, work and live. And uh, they don't always come out of it all that well. People are individuals. Uh, there are no two human beings alike. The possibility of there being two human beings alike, the possibilities are so s remote, so staggering, that it, it probably has never happened and will never happen, except in the case of single-egg twins, I suppose. So a person is a single, original human creature. He is different in certain ways from all other human beings. Yet when he gets into kindergarten and into school, he's forced to be like all the other little kids. He has the same desk, he has the same pencils, he has the same, does the same studies. He begins to be pushed into a part of a group. Now, it's important to work as a part of a team. It's important to be a good team worker. It's important to be a good team member. It's important to uh, do your part in that kind of an arrangement. But he lives so much of that, and uh, his mother tells him, that you shouldn't do that, you shouldn't do this. Uh, good little boys don't do that. Good little girls don't do that. He is milled down to some extent until he begins to see himself, or she begins to see herself, 
as sort of an indistinguishable member of a large group of people that age. And then, of course, youngsters go through a time when it's very important that they be accepted by their peers. And so the most important thing they can do in the world is to become indistinguishable from their peers. They dress alike. They wear the same clothes. I did when I was in high school. We all did. I remember when my daughter used to spend a couple of hours uh, working at getting so scuzzy in her dress, as she used to put it, so that her jeans would look so faded and her, you know, everything would look so secondhand. If people knew how hard they worked to look so shabby, you know, they wouldn't believe it. But she had to do that in order to fit into her group. And of course, we go through that. Then in college, you know, the same thing goes on. People in college are again fit into groups and they get into things like social psychology and that. And they are in many ways socialized as persons. Uh, quite often, the individual is lost sight of in all of this big, thick melange of things that goes on. And um, what someone needs to do is, is keep reminding them every day, you know, hey, remember now, you're a distinct individual with distinct uh, possibilities. And, of course, they don't do that. Lewis Mumford has written that the great mass of comfortable, well-fed people of our civilization live lives of emotional apathy and mental torpor. Lives of enfeebled desire, second-hand, derivative lives. And he said the Greeks had a word for this pallid simulacrum of real existence. They called it Hades. One of the fastest-growing groups in our society is the inner directed now. They're really coming out of it. I think that's partly been responsible for the phenomenal growth of our corporation. Because more people now are saying are shaking off the old shibboleths. They're shaking off the old myths and stories, and they're saying, I'm going to do it, I'm going to make it, I'm going to really live this life, and in so doing, I'm going to render the greatest possible service. Sidney Harris began his strictly personal column back in 1943. He had a number of books published, all of which I think I own and enjoy. One of my favorite columns was one in which he told about walking with a friend of his to the newsstand. His friend bought a paper, thanking the vendor politely. The vendor didn't even acknowledge it. A sullen fellow, isn't he? Harris commented. Always that way every night, shrugged his friend. Then why do you continue being so polite to him? Sidney Harris asked. Why not? inquired his friend. Why should I let him decide how I'm going to act? As Harris thought about the incident later, it occurred to him that the operating word was act. His friend acts toward people. Many of us react toward them. He has a sense of inner balance lacking in many of us frail and uncertain creatures. He knows who he is, what he stands for, and how he should behave. No boor is going to disturb the equilibrium of his nature. He simply refuses to return incivility with incivility, because then he'd no longer be in command of his own conduct, but a mere responder to others. When we're enjoined in the Bible to return good for evil, we look upon this as a moral injunction, which it is, but it's also a psychological prescription for our emotional health. Nobody is unhappier than the perpetual reactor. His center of emotional gravity is not rooted within himself where it belongs, but in the world outside him. His spiritual temperature is always being raised or lowered by the social climate around him, and he's a mere creature at the mercy of these elements. Praise gives him a feeling of euphoria, which is false because it doesn't last and it doesn't come from self-approval. Criticism depresses him more than it should because it confirms his own secretly shaky opinion of himself. Snubs hurt him, and the merest suspicion of unpopularity in any quarter rouses him to bitterness or aggressiveness or querulousness. Only a saint, of course, never reacts, but a serenity of spirit cannot be achieved until we become the masters of our own actions and attitudes, and not merely reactors to other people's feelings. To let another determine whether we shall be rude or gracious, elated or depressed, is to relinquish control over our own personalities, which is ultimately all we possess. The only true possession is self-possession. A wise man once wrote, to be human is to feel inferior. 
Did you know that there's probably not a human being alive who doesn't have feelings of inferiority? He or she may not be born with them, but such feelings are soon developed. Will Rogers said we're all ignorant only about different things, and it's also true that we are all inferior in different ways. The person with a healthy, happy attitude toward his or her world recognizes his or her inferiorities as a normal part of being human. The neurotic or unbalanced people hate themselves for their inferiorities. They feel they represent weaknesses and abnormalities when they really do nothing of the kind. Well-adjusted people frankly admire others for their talents and abilities without feeling envious. In fact, they don't even bring themselves into comparison at all. They're happily resigned to the fact that they're not the best-looking, best-built, smartest, most talented, fastest, cleverest, funniest, most engaging people on Earth. Without even thinking about it, they seem to know that every person is a potpourri of strengths and weaknesses inherited from all of his ancestors. No two of them were alike, but each one has a slightly different strong point with the standard collection of weaknesses. If we have knobby knees or big feet or an off-kilter figure or have to wear glasses or fail to cause people of the opposite sex to tear at our clothes as we walk down the street or can't do complicated mathematical equations in our heads, we still represent that which we've been given. The most intelligent and healthy thing we can do about it is to make best use of what we do have, and what we have is considerable. The experts say that each of us has deep reservoirs of ability, even genius, that we habitually fail to make use of. We fail to make use of our own private and individual talents because we're caught up in the absurd and impossible game of trying to be like other people who could no more be like us than we could be like them. We forget that other people feel inferior too. Since there's no one else on earth just like us, how can we be inferior? We are, each of us, one of a kind, defying rigid comparison by any measuring stick. The next time you're in a room full of people, remember that every one of them feels inferior to some degree in many areas, just as you and I do. Consider your strong points. Be yourself and join the human race. Try to concentrate on things that take your mind and your interest away from yourself. If you spend your life trying to match the strong points of others, you're doomed to a life of frustration and despair, and you never develop your own strong points. One day a few years back, I stopped my car for gas at a service station in Hollywood, California. While the middle-aged owner of the station cheerfully went about taking care of my car's needs, I noticed that while the station was by no means new, it was spotlessly clean. I was particularly surprised at the driveway. It was as clean as if my car were the first to use it. I asked the owner how in the world he managed to keep the driveway spotless with dozens of cars dripping oil and tracking the dirt of the highways on it. He told me how a common product sold at every supermarket was, in his estimation, the best driveway cleaner in the world. He beamed in response to my comment on the way he kept the place of business. It was a valuable moment for both of us. I learned something of value, and he experienced the pleasure of honest praise. The need for praise is basic to everyone. With it, a person blooms and grows. Without it, he tends to shrink and withdraw into himself. We all know children need constant praise and encouragement. When a child brings home a piece of artwork that looks for all the world like an unfortunate accident, he still expects an encouraging word, but his need for encouragement is no less than his mother's or father's. Far too many parents aren't getting any praise, or at least not nearly enough. Understanding the importance of self-esteem and seeing the never-ending need for reaffirmation of a person's worth we should make it our business to watch for honest opportunities to give praise, especially to the members of our family and those with whom we work. There's a subtle but enormously valuable byproduct or backfire to this sort of thing. In order to praise others, we need to look for the good. It forces us to concentrate on what's right with people and the things they do rather than on what's wrong. It focuses our attention on the positive side of the ledger and, as a result, makes us happier, more productive, and more present to be around. Then, too, people like those who praise them and recognize their value. When we give praise, we attract a larger circle of friends. And finally, giving praise is the best-known way to receive it. It's hard for anyone to compliment a chronic grouch. 
Whenever you hear someone say, nobody appreciates me, nobody gives me credit for all I do, the chances are he's so wrapped up in himself and in getting happiness from others, he's completely forgotten how to give. We should try to find some way to commend those we love every day.